This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. We just did a major overhaul of our patrons-only Discord server, so if you'd like to join our growing community and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash secondthought. You've read the title, you've seen the thumbnail, you've inspected the element and combed through the metadata. This episode is about moderates, centrists, independents, pragmatists, middle grounders, fence straddlers, and the ungodly, unceremonious, electable politician. Today, we're looking at everyone's political neighbors in the middle of the street. Let's get this started. Cue the MLK. First, I must, must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. Look, I already know what you're going to say. JT, please describe to me in political science terms what a moderate is. Fine but only because I want to. And as punishment for being so presumptuous, I'll start with the difference between the left and the right. You probably already know the story of the two terms. During the French Revolution, those who wanted to laisser les bons temps brûler with absolute monarchical power sat on the right side of the assembly, their version of the house, and the no-good radicals who wanted to try out terrifying and capricious parliamentary monarchy, ooh, sat on the left. This is a pretty specific issue to disagree about. So when people, i.e. academics with too much free time, try to come up with meaningful differences between the left and the right that hold true across most of global political history, you get very vague distinctions between the two political families. While today we associate the left and the right mostly with their stances on specific economic issues or cultural debates, the most fundamental distinction that you can probably draw between these two is that the left seeks to change society into something new, and the right seeks to preserve present society or go back to something old. In practice, that usually means the left seeks to undermine established hierarchies and distribute power and wealth more equally, and the right seeks to preserve hierarchy and order since most existing societies are or were built around power being concentrated in very few hands. But obviously, such a simple distinction will certainly make you mad. So be sure to comment why and how I've actually gotten it completely wrong in the comments section. I sure would hate for this video to get more engagement. Anyway, we've lost the plot a little bit here. We're not focusing on either of these groups. We're talking about the illuminated minds who can look past the squabbling of these dirty extremes. Moderates. The people who reject petty ideological battles. And at the end of the day, just know better than you and I. Just listen to how terrible the extremes are in this No Labels video on the Biden infrastructure bill. We've seen this movie before. Total. No, not those movies. This one. We will not support bipartisan legislation. I'm telling the Republican senators that we're not going to stand for it. The extremes on the left and right are trying to defeat a two-party solution for partisan purposes. Three out of four Americans agree on the infrastructure bill that creates jobs, helps families, doesn't raise taxes, and powers America to beat China. Don't listen to the extremes. Support bipartisan infrastructure now. Cool. Okay, fine. Let's be a little bit more charitable and actually understand what's going on here. Centrists and moderates in the US, the two terms are pretty much interchangeable, are people and politicians who are not entirely satisfied with the political programs of either major political party. Unlike people who reject both parties from the opposite ends of the spectrum, moderates are most at home in the supposed bipartisan middle. They usually like saying things like, we're neither left nor right. We'll get to that sentence in a minute. But first, we might want to understand centrists a little better. If we are to assume the definition of left and right as historically transcendent terms about the stance one has towards present society and values like egalitarianism, being a centrist doesn't really make sense. Over time, movements that start out on the left like liberalism, republicanism, or even parliamentary monarchy 
become solidly right-wing movements without ever changing their ideology because they replace the old right and become contested by the new, more radical left. In such a position, centrism becomes nothing more than a conservative ideology. Its prime directive is resistance to change, and as a result, it's not, as they claim, neither left nor right, it's just right-wing. It might have been on the left in yesterday's society, but now that the goals of the old left are the established order and have become the new conservative right, preserving present society with only incremental and moderate reform, which is what centrists believe in, becomes a profoundly conservative worldview. And it makes sense that this is where moderacy settles, because it has to compromise between two completely opposing ideas, changing society in a new way or keeping it the same. Think about classic centrist statements like, we just need a mix of socialism and capitalism, an idea that makes absolutely zero sense when you understand the two ideologies and that their base disagreement about the ownership of the means of production makes them fundamentally incompatible. Okay, this all might seem a little confusing. Let's get away from the theory for a second and look at something concrete, like the Biden brand of centrism. I know how to make government work. about it, but because I've done it. I've worked across the aisle to reach consensus, to help make government work in the past. I can do that again with your help. For me, for me, to me, our principles must never be compromised, but compromise itself is not a dirty word. Consensus is not a weakness. It's the only way our founders down the road there thought it was the only way we could govern. It was necessary. It was designed the way the Constitution sits. It requires consensus. This speech is Biden's free bird. Biden, like pretty much every centrist, is a big fan of compromise. Reaching across the aisle to get past political gridlock is the doctrine of American centrism. And when you hear him talk about it, you can kind of get sucked into the idea that this form of compromise is what makes politics, and therefore society, progress. It appeals to our vision of the democratic ideal, a society in which everyone gathers around the table to discuss an issue and then comes to a mutual decision that compromises on the various interests represented by the assembly. And if after all nobody compromises, we might very well not get anywhere. In American politics, this is anything but democratic though. And far from leading to the progress we're promised, we get a government that stagnates or actively pursues regressive, reactionary politics. Take immigration. For over a year, we heard just about every Democrat call out the very real far-right policies enacted by the Trump admin at the Mexican border. One of these was the invocation of Title 42, a policy choice that might as well be called, oh, it really is just that easy. At the start of the pandemic, the Trump administration used the pretext of national health and COVID-19 to close the southern border pretty much completely. Nobody comes in, and a whole lot of people go out. It was a brilliant success for conservatives and reactionaries, and a massive step back in immigration law. And to this day, Title 42 still stands. No, sorry, that makes it seem like people aren't paying attention to it. The Biden administration is defending it tooth and nail in the courts. True to the spirit of compromise, Biden changed the application of the rule so that it would no longer apply to unaccompanied minors but on the back end has used it to expel around 700,000 migrants, far more than the Trump administration ever achieved with its paltry 450,000. Simultaneously, Biden has also continued the construction of the border wall, has led the infamous Do Not Come campaign, and left untouched migrant detention facilities. You'll remember them as concentration camps during the Trump presidency. Now, it's not that Biden has done nothing for progressive immigration politics. He's reinstated DACA and done work to reunite separated families. But the majority of his platform has been tweaking Trump-era policies in the spirit of compromise, rather than reversing them entirely and treating them like the indefensible right-wing policies that they are. Centrism isn't incremental progress in these circumstances. Malcolm X said it best. You feel, however, that uh, that we're making progress in, in this country no, and worldwide? No, no, no. I'm, I, I will never say that progress is being made. If you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, there's no progress. If you pull it all the way out, that's not progress. The progress is healing the wound that the blow, that the blow made. Have you have they no won't even admit the knife is there. 
when reactionary and far-right politics are so dominant in a society as the US, and so regularly find their way to institutions of power, or are baked in right from the start. The centrist stance of compromise and incremental retroactive change allows for politics to jump to the right without ever really coming back. How many politicians today pretend that there's a reasonable compromise between the we need healthcare left and the we need an ethno state right? Title 42 still stands because the myopic compromise of moderate ideology fails to take into account longer political trends. There are, of course, some exceptions to the rightward shift of American politics. But the attachment to moderation at all costs makes any left-wing legislation a blip in what is otherwise a sea of reactionary bravado. But most centrists don't like this, and that's not how they think about themselves. They don't like the idea that they're just a mushy average of the left and the right, or a simple tool of conservative politics. Instead, moderates describe their stance something like this. I don't care whether something comes from the left or the right, I just look at the idea and judge it on its own merit. Here, the tricky centrist thinks he's gotten us. We couldn't possibly disagree with the idea of sensibly considering multiple options and forming an opinion based on rational cost and benefit analyses. And he's right, but at the end of the day, centrism falls right back into the same place whether it sees its role as averaging out the left and the right, or picking and choosing from each side. And that's because the Overton window is so small and so skewed in the US. The choices centrists make are limited by the acceptable politics they are contextualized in, and the American political spectrum being so stunted toward the right with only figures like Bernie Sanders and his social democratic politics even approaching the left means that centrism will by default fall into the conservative, stagnatory, or even regressive role. There just aren't that many options to choose from, and they're mostly on the same side anyway. Even if the centrist voter is a careful and considerate pragmatist who doesn't blindly follow the party line and thinks entirely for themselves on every topic and political debate, the inevitable fact that they will be picking and choosing policies from the fascistic Trumpism in the Republican Party and the neoliberal capitalism of the Democrats, to the extent that they can even be differentiated at times, means they'll never actually consider the full range of political debate because the left isn't prominently represented. The result is the center conserves far more than it progresses. And when it chooses to conserve something built by the right, it actively engages in regressive, reactionary politics. There's also the issue that politicians who call themselves the center aren't really doing so in good faith. While they may represent the center between elected officials, the actual center of the American people is far more to the left on many key issues than the center of the American political class. Just look at this clip featuring celebrity centrist Joe Lieberman. Your new book is called The Centrist Solution. Uh, you were a famous quote unquote centrist senator. Uh, and yet my issue with that word is that centrist doesn't necessarily reflect the American people's views. I want to pull up uh, some polling. Here are some of the measures in that Build Back Better bill that quote unquote centrists like Manchin and Cinema want to get rid of. Here's how popular they are. Hugely popular across the spectrum, 83% support, 84% support, 73% support. And yet you and Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema oppose many of those measures that the American people overwhelmingly support. So the question is, how in the world does that make you a centrist? Surely based on that polling, Bernie right. Sanders is closer to the center of American politics and public opinion than you are or Joe Manchin is. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so, but it's a great question. That's not happening enough now. We could probably get some of those good things done on that list if people, instead of trying to push it through, would sit down and talk to each other and agree. And here we get back to that MLK quote. It's absurd to think that any moderate Democrat or any Republican would ever agree to any of these policies that have overwhelming support among Americans if the only difference was that they were sat down and talked to as opposed to having things, quote, pushed through. There is no way that moderate Democrats like Manchin, Cinema, or Biden are going to be convinced by good argumentation presented politely when that is contending with the massive sums of money changing hands to make sure they remain spoilers. MLK made it very clear. The moderates' role in politics is to slow things down to a trickle. Justice gets delayed further and further, never actually realized despite decades of promises, allowing for millions of people to continue suffering injustice and hundreds of thousands more to be brought into the fold. It's trite, but justice delayed is justice denied. 
The issue we're going to have to figure out is how we do anything about this. In every election, moderates are going to dominate the field because they will continuously be presented as more sensible, measured, and pragmatic than their opponents. They have done the careful electoral calculation and know that between the people who will inevitably vote for them and the people who will never vote for them regardless of what they do, the only way to win is to present themselves to the colossal group of American moderates who won't bother to go any further than see who gets closest to being the exact average of the Democrats and the Republicans. We know Americans want more from their politicians. We know that, for the greatest number of them, those things are further to the left than anything the government has provided in decades. That is a much bigger issue for our democracy than polarization. Democracy is slow by nature, and there are times when that can be a good thing. But when democracy is slowed down artificially like this, just for the sake of slowing it down and not letting things change for the better, when politicians ignore what people not only demand, but desperately need, it no longer resembles democracy nor its ideals. If you're hearing an appeal to authoritarianism or something in these statements, you're not understanding what I'm saying. We need far greater democracy than what we have today. Real democracy. Democracy for the majority. And continuing to venerate moderates in this country won't bring us any closer to getting it. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this kind of content is made possible by my patrons on Patreon. As you can probably imagine, when I made the switch to producing political content, I started getting demonetized way more often, and most of my sponsors bailed. It's understandable, but because of this, I'm having to rely more heavily on viewers like you. If you like the kind of videos I'm producing, and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. As a little show of that appreciation, every patron, regardless of donation amount, gets early access to every video, plus access to our patrons-only Discord server. We actually just dropped a major update to the Discord, and there are some really cool new features. We've got everything from a recommended reading list, to a book club, to special channels for our neurodivergent and LGBT comrades. We also have fun medal rolls for people who complete the server challenges. We've built a great little community, and we'd love for you to be a part of it. So if you'd like to help support my channel, join the Discord, and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash secondthought. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous videos by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.